Reversed. Greetings, I'm Shad, and recently good old Scarlagrim has done a reply to my video on barbarian armor, and it furthers the discussion, he raises some really interesting points that I would also like to comment on, and perhaps add an additional thought or two of my own. And even though there will be a focus on the fantasy style bikini armor, as well as chainmail bikini armor, I like to extend every aspect of this discussion to revealing male armor as well, if it's applicable and if there is precedent for it. What aspects of this outfit could be considered actual armor, and how beneficial or detrimental certain partial armor pieces could be, as well as the best weapons that would suit this type of armor, but also suit, match, complement the philosophy that might justify it. Although not required watching, I do encourage you to go check out my previous video on if the fantasy barbarian can be realistic, as well as Scarlagrim's reply video, and if you want an additional commentary on the idea of modesty, sexualization, power fantasy, and other things, the, you know, the more political kind of topics that can arise out of a discussion, you could also check out my video on the possible sexualization of the fantasy barbarian and the power fantasy aspect to it as well. The ultimate takeaway from both my video and Scargrim's video is that the classic loincloth wearing kind of barbarian can actually make sense. It can be realistic when approached in a practical kind of mindset. There are a lot of real world historical equivalents where past cultures wore less clothing and even went into combat wearing not only just little clothing and armor, but being completely naked. One of the most significant things that we learn from these historical references is that they more often carried shields with them, so they didn't throw the idea of defense out the window. No, it was very present in their mind, and a really effective shield can offer massive amounts of defense, and you can also get some of the interesting kind of advantages that people did actually get when wearing little to no clothing at all in actual combat. And to paraphrase some of the points in Skulls and my own video, is that it doesn't weigh you down nearly as much. You'd be able to fight for longer with your skin exposed, and wearing little to nothing at all. I mean, look at what modern day athletes wear when they're competing, okay? They have their skin exposed so the sweat can cool them down, alright? So in physical exertion, it's not an uncommon thing to wear little clothing, and of course in the original Olympics, they actually competed naked. So for a warrior or warrior culture that was very mindful of physical exertion and being able to maintain this level of physicality for a longer period of time, well, wearing little to no clothing can actually make perfectly valid sense and we have seen it done in the past as well. Once again, it makes far, far more sense when they use a shield in conjunction with it, because then they get the advantage of the physical exertion and stuff, and defense as well. And then there are the other kind of cultural aspects around modesty and other things like that, about actually intimidating your opponent, showing bravery, and also showing off a very impressive physical stature if they have it as well. And so if this was highly prized in the culture, especially having a really impressive physicality, showing off those impressive gains, well then, yes, it actually can make perfectly valid sense for a barbarian culture to have a very different standard of modesty than what we generally think is appropriate or practical in the modern day. So now from building on that foundation, one of the first points that Skarlgrim brings up I totally agree with. In fact, it is the exact same point I raised in my kind of additional video to my first barbarian video on the sexualization aspect, and this is what I say. If a character is supposed to be a warrior and powerful, and have trained their whole lives to, you know, know how to fight, they're gonna have a decent amount of muscle on them, aren't they? I mean, have a look at Ronda Rousey, a female MMA fighter, alright? This is what a female warrior would look like. She's got muscle on her. And so, a female warrior, they, uh, no, they're not gonna be skinny supermodels. So, absolutely, not only a female barbarian, but also female warrior, should, of course, look athletic in some measure, have some amount of muscle or physicality in their appearance for them to logically appear as an athlete, a warrior, because a warrior is essentially a type of athlete. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that they need to have massive muscles, just that it doesn't make sense if they're skinny and you can't see any physicality on them as well, because we actually can see many Olympic level athletes not being that well built, but being hugely physically capable and their muscles are usually showing, but they're not huge. They're either toned and they're very thin, but it can be either way. So it kind of depends on which warrior 
you're trying to portray, but at least portraying them that they are very physically fit, of course, is a far more realistic representation of any type of warrior, let alone just the fantasy barbarian. And then if you want to add the strength aspect to it, well then, size of muscles is correlated to strength as well. If a culture prized physical strength and stature amongst all else, the biggest and strongest in this culture are the ones having the children who, of course, result in being bigger and stronger on average, and then that creates a whole race that is just generally bigger and stronger, so there you go, it can work. Scaligan brought up an interesting point that I want to explore a bit further, and I'm paraphrasing what he's saying here. He was essentially saying because a barbarian was wearing less armor, using two-handed weapons would be better for them because it offers better defensive advantage, and then he kind of criticizes when barbarians are using two-handed weapons that don't have very good reach on them because they don't really get that defensive advantage. And that's a great point. I loved it. And I started to consider then what would be the best kind of weapons for a barbarian to pick if they weren't using a shield? Because I always think, all right, if a barbarian isn't wearing much armor uh, and they're just wearing the classic loincloth kind of thing, shield is Best pick. Always shield, okay? But what if you do want to use a two-handed weapon? Now, the circumstances in which you could get away with not using a shield is when you know you're not facing arrow fire. Arrow fire is basically the primary thing when you need a shield. And we're looking at this in a more realistic lens, because I know in fantasy they just can deflect arrows with their weapons. But in reality, no, they're not going to be able to do that, especially if there's a lot of arrows being shot at them. This is why a shield is always such a huge pick. But when you take arrows out of the picture, there are techniques and weapon sets that you can pick that offer a huge amount of defensive advantage. For instance, dual wielding. Dual wielding is actually a very potent kind of combination. You get a lot of advantages just having the option of being able to defend an attack, a double attacker, and redirect your opponent. Like, it's actually really effective. The massive weakness with dual wielding is that it can't defend you against arrow fire, which is why it was rarely ever done. The other disadvantage is that you don't get nearly the level of leverage that you can get with a two-handed weapon or the reach, and reach is a profoundly important thing. In fact, a weapon with greater reach can offer even greater defensive advantage because you can keep your opponent further away from you. And that was Scarlagrim's point, which is why when a barbarian is not using a shield, it makes far more sense for them to use a longer two-handed weapon. Specifically, we'll be looking at things like spears, pole arms, and longer two-handed swords. Not necessarily the two-handed axe, but then what do you call a two-handed axe? Because there are pole axes, like literally the pole axe. The Bardish, well, that one's a little bit more tricky because it's much shorter. And that goes the same with the Dane axe. You see, one of the big problems with axes is that they have terrible defensive capacity. This can kind of work the same way with pole arms, yet not necessarily, because say the pole axe, that has a spike on the opposite end, and there are certain techniques that you can use to get great defensive advantage out of the pole axe by presenting that tip to your opponent, having the axe head held near your head ready to do big wide strikes, and so you can actually employ the pole axe very effectively in defense, but smaller two-handed axes, we're not talking about one hand, but still the type of two-handed axes that have the length of, say, a woodcutting axe, they have horrible defense. And what's really interesting about this, when I consider it, it turns out these types of axes, one-handed axes and smaller two-handed axes, which are far more stereotypically matched with the fantasy barbarian, would actually be really bad picks for a barbarian. The only times you would use an actual barbarian-style fantasy axe would be a one-handed axe in conjunction with a shield. If you don't have a shield, using this style of axe would be a terrible pick, which is so contrary contrary to the classic stereotypical barbarian. The most iconic stereotypical weapons that should be seen with the barbarian, when you think barbarian, you think of these weapons, should be a shield or a spear or a big long two-handed sword. Now, there's, you know, big barbarian style sword, that is a bit of a stereotypical weapon that's associated with the barbarian, granted, but also the axe. And like I said, I think the axe has a lot more problems if you're actually looking at the barbarian in the sense that this is a warrior who isn't wearing much armor, so you need to use weapons that account for that, that actually add some defensive advantage. 
Hence why shields or weapons with reach to keep your opponents at bay, which would be spears and pole arms. Maybe they're still may and maybe you get away with an axe head and a pole arm, but more predominantly spears and longer two-handed swords. So war swords or great swords, but oddly enough, great swords aren't necessarily a medieval kind of way. Well, it depends on what type of great sword, granted. But they're more early Renaissance kind of a weapon. But we adapt them in fantasy, and so if you're looking at great sword for a barbarian, it'll be a barbarian style greatsword. And then if you're being more historically accurate, it wouldn't be this massive chunk of metal on a handle, okay? Greatswords are actually very thin-bladed weapons, otherwise they'd be too heavy. I totally agree with Scarlagrim regarding his comments on the bikini chainmail armor. Because it's not armor, okay? Chainmail covering only those parts of the body, and as Scarlagrim mentioned, the propensity if you actually hit that part of the body or deflect off onto the unarmored parts, and, and there's so many open areas, that it's not armor. Could it be a type of fashion? That one's actually kind of interesting because why does bikini chainmail exist in the modern day? It's actually, you that exists, okay? Some people actually find it attractive. And so that, in my mind, actually creates a type of precedent that it could exist in a fantasy setting, not for armor, but as a type of fashion kind of thing, just chainmail clothing. And it would be heavier than loincloths or hide, leather, whatever bikinis. But if this culture, say, prized metal, and wearing metal was a sign of wealth or reflected something in their culture, well, I could actually see chainmail clothing being a thing. There would be some interesting results, I would feel, that would manifest from it. For instance, if this was just clothing, they wouldn't be making it to be effective armor. If this was just there for the pure aesthetic and look, it wouldn't be riveted. It would just be basic butted mail, and I think the rings would be really small and fine to prevent chafing, as Scargram mentioning, and there probably might be cloth layer underneath to prevent that chafing, and also to reduce the weight, because it's only there for the look. I would then expect this fashion kind of sense to manifest in other ways, like chainmail bangles or chainmail kind of chains around the neck, you know, jewellery, adornments, other types of clothing like chainmail belts. The straps that they use to hang things on, like their shields, would be made out of chainmail, things like that. So if chainmail actually was worn as a fashionable thing, instead of a purely practical thing for armour, I would see it manifest in other types of clothing as well. And if this barbarian culture had a different modesty standard, where showing off a physically fit body was prized in their culture, well then they would wear clothing that revealed more skin, and I could see a chainmail bikini and even chainmail loincloths manifesting in this culture. Because that's the thing, if chainmail bikinis existed, it's about being logically consistent. Because, okay, then where are the chainmail loincloths for the guys? Because there are ways to logically justify this in the world building, but if you do then, you need to be consistent. Which is something that I've said, and also Scarlagrim mentions in his video as well. So the last thing I want to talk about is the idea of partial armor, and Scarlagrim again raises such like a really interesting point. And this point is something that I even have also kind of mentioned tangentially in a different kind of uh, perspective in a video on my other channel, Game Night talking about why short sleeve mail shirts existed. And the takeaway from that is that longer sleeve chain mail shirts actually exhaust your arms much longer. And this is connected to Skalgrim's point, is that limb armor, armor that is on the forearm and legs, actually exhaust you more than armor that you wear on your torso, because it's further away from the points of leverage, and it, it takes more physical exertion to move your arms around when they're weighed down like that. And I've experienced that when wearing my Brigandine braces, my arms get exhausted wearing those things and they're not massively heavy but the, their weights on the ends of my arms and it exhausts me down so much that it doesn't take too much arm movement wearing these braces to the point that I can't even shoot my longbow and it's my heavy longbow it takes a certain amount of strength to pull that back but when my arms are exhausted I can't do it and so Skargrim's point is that if this culture wore less armor to maintain their physicality longer to not be exhausted well then it wouldn't make much sense for them to be wearing limb armor but gauntlets even though gauntlets are on the, uh, you know, further extent of the limbs, if you, you know, have modest gauntlets that protect the fingers and hands and perhaps not the full forearms, well, those are vulnerable areas because this comes to the idea that, okay, if this barbarian culture is wearing less armor, but they're not idiots. They haven't ignored the idea of defense. They still use a shield or weapons that add defensive capacity, like weapons of reach, 
They would then still be mindful of the areas on the body that are more vulnerable than others, and the hands are primary targets, particularly when you're not using a shield. Scarlagrim's point about armor on the lower legs, again, a brilliant point. This would be perhaps a priority if they're using a shield, but if they're not using a shield, it's actually not too difficult to defend your legs. And oh, look, I've actually experienced this in my own real world practice and experimentation. When you're using a shield, one of the primary targets actually ends up being your legs because they're one of the vulnerable areas, and so your opponents go for the legs far more. But when you're not using a shield, what's interesting is not only do they go for the legs less, but when they do, you can see them going for the legs much easier. Because one of the interesting disadvantages of the shield is that it blocks off your line of sight. It's hard to see where your opponent is attacking, especially on the side that you're holding the shield from. And my experience when using a shield is that it was harder for me to see them going for my legs, and therefore it was harder for me to move them out of the way, and they got hit more often. But when I'm not using a shield, the telegraphing of your opponent leaning down to get your legs is so much easier to spot that I just move my legs out of the way and they get hit far less. And so it's this interesting kind of reality that when you're not using a shield, leg protection isn't as important as when you are using a shield, which seems counterintuitive because a shield offers greater protection, but it's actually a matter of your line of sight and what you can see and what targets your opponent is going to go for more often. And it's this consideration in which the infamous shoulder plate comes in. Like, so many barbarians have a single shoulder guard, like a single pauldron on one shoulder. And, like, it's nonsensical for the most part. If you're just a barbarian who's not using a shield, okay, and you're willing to wear the weight of, say, a pauldron, well, then why wouldn't you wear, like, the weight of a smaller breastplate, which covers far more vital organs, and depending on the size of the pauldron, especially fantasy pauldrons, some of, like, these fantasy pauldrons look like they would weigh far more than a breastplate. A real-world breastplate would only weigh a little bit more, but because it's actually resting on your center of mass, it's easier to wear than other types of armor that rests on the limbs. And granted, the shoulder isn't that far extended away from the center of mass, but still, that's a good point to consider. But then this is where the question comes in. Would they really be that dedicated to the cultural practices of showing off their muscles than actually wearing armor that protects themselves that saves their life? I'm not sure. But remember, if they're using a shield then, that is where I would feel it's perfectly logically valid that this culture, these warriors, would feel the shield is offering ample enough protection for them to show off those muscles, and uh, they're not overly vulnerable in combat. And it's when you add a shield that you might actually want a single kind of pauldron on one shoulder on the side that you are holding the shield with, because one of the vulnerable areas when you're holding a shield is the shoulder. Your chest is usually quite well protected when you're holding a shield. And so if this warrior is willing to wear one or two bits of additional armor that won't weigh them down too much, just cover the areas. The most vulnerable areas when you're using a shield actually isn't the torso anymore. The shoulder and shins are, and even the other arm that's holding your weapon. And so again, if you're considering what type of additional small bits of armor you might wear that won't weigh you down too much, and so you can still be more active, okay, shins and a shoulder piece might get away. But again, if you start to then add more armor, like on the weapon arm, uh, especially on the forearm, that could then really start to weigh you down because it's on the limbs, it's further away from the point of leverage. So there would be a kind of limit, but it again goes into that interesting like a contrast that when you're using a shield, the area in which you choose to protect is different than when you're not using a shield. Because when you're not using a shield, well, the shield isn't protecting your main vital organs anymore. And so the most primary place you'll put armor to protect yourself would be then on your torso. The other type of partial armor that would make sense for this barbarian culture or single barbarian to use is something that Skargrim also mentioned, like a fully armored single arm in lieu of a shield. Now, I think you would only do this if you knew you weren't facing arrow fire, once again, because a shield is the best thing to defend against arrow fire, and a fully armored arm, like we see in certain gladiators and things, would actually be a very effective, active defensive tool. It wouldn't weigh the barbarian down too much, so they could still maintain that philosophy of fighting in such a way that requires extended physical exertion, where other people who are wearing more armor would tie out quicker, where they can maintain their physical exertion for much longer because they're not wearing as much, their skin is exposed, they can cool down easier, and so they're more like endurance fighters than quick fighters. And they'd still get that with a fully armored arm by leaving the rest of their body exposed. They'd still be following this cultural practice of prizing physical prowess, physical strength, showing off the muscles. 
it also being a type of intimidation and a sign of bravery and things like that. So that all fits in well, and they get a decent amount of defensive advantage. And then they might be able to use an axe, because they have something that now they can defend with. Axes are terrible at defending on their own, but then if you have this fully armored arm, okay, that can work. Or, better yet, honestly, just use a shield. But still, this is an example of partial armor that can make sense with a fantasy barbarian. When it comes to weird partial armor, like chainmail bikinis that are meant to be armor, that's useless. And also weird kind of metal bits of armor on, the, say, the hips, that's very weird. But like I said, some do make sense when you combine it with a shield specifically. Thank you very much for watching, and if you would like to help boost this video, a like and a comment would help tremendously. If you can't think of anything to say in the comment section, feel free to drop a Red Sonya or Conan, the two primary fantasy character examples who love to wear the uh, more revealing kind of armor, or not armor, as we've kind of discussed in this video. And so there we go, this has been a really fun discussion, and I'm really grateful to Scarlagrim furthering the discussion and giving me something to not only, you know, think about a bit more on, but also to uh, revisit a fun subject. And I hope you've enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.